We weren't actually called part one there, we, that was called the Bushy Part Time Trial. Every single pair of trainers is white. I don't think you could buy a pair of white trainers these days if you, if you tried. But the technology then was very simple and we were founded by technologists, but Paul Sinton Hewitt, our founder, he used a stopwatch uh, and a clipboard uh, and a pen and an Excel sheet. And so the way to register was you turn up on the day and said hi, he wrote your name down on a piece of paper, then you ran around, he timed you with a stopwatch, and obviously with just 13 people, that was quite easy to do. And part one was born, and the idea was that it would be this free weekly time, 5K at the time run, that would be there forever. I was working at the time as a lecturer in sport and exercise science. I'd done a master's degree in sport and exercise science at Leeds Met. I'd gone to Leeds University, got a job. And then we were in this meeting, and, and the, the topic of the meeting was how do we do this, engage the students with the community, and I, I put my hand up thought, I've got this great idea uh, that somebody's doing down south, we could copy it. So I wrote it into the sports science course at Leeds Uni that they had to volunteer at what's now called Park Run uh, twice a year or they wouldn't get their degree. I've still got my email from registering, so I registered in the summer of 2007, Park Runner 6013. At that time, you, you literally had to cut and paste a little disclaimer from the website. They utilised the really great timing system at the time, which we still effectively use, even though we process a million results a month, not, not 50. Um, but what you did is you all stood down the start line, they said go, press the stopwatch button and off you went until the timer was running. And when you crossed the finish line, you got given a, a metal disc with your finish position on. And Paul had developed that technology himself and, and stamped one, two, three, four and so on these metal discs. You took your disc to somebody who was sat at a computer, they put a little, they put a little 10 by your name and you got 10. And of course at the same time the stopwatch had taken your time. And then we wrote all of our own software to link those two things together. This is a really important part in our journey. It was the first steps outside London. And we also coined a phrase then, uh, walk it, jog it, run it. And I think this would have happened anyway. So I don't think we should necessarily take credit for that. And it, he had this kind of vision of growing it. And I and had three events in West London, and then we were number four. And I said to Paul, you know, what's your vision for it? And he said, wouldn't it be great if there was, a, if there was one of these in every single town in the world? Which is an amazing statement to make when you've only got three and they're all quite small and they're all in West London. A part of Paul's, Paul's great strength is his total lack of long-term strategy. <laughs> because you can only say that if you're a little bit mad. Maybe one day we will have one in every town in the world, but we had to have that, that level of incredible vision at the beginning. So fast forwarding a, a, a long way, this is Kyle Township in just outside Cape Town. So this is a group of local kids from a local chat, brought there by a local charity called the Vision Charity. But this park run is there, you can see the township in the background. This park run is there every single week, 52 weeks of the year, plus Christmas Day, plus January the 1st. And when we go back, when we think back to that original 13 white middle class people in West London, you just couldn't get much further removed. This was until we recently started in, in Tokyo. This was our most remote part run in the world. So this is in a place called Ukutsk in Siberia. I, I said to them when they wanted to start, I said, do you want to only run in the summer? So all of our events are all year round. So it does get down to minus 60. Uh, and they just kind of spoke to me as if I was stupid and said, we'll just wear more clothes. And in the summer, it can get to plus 40. So they can have a 100 degree swing centigrade from winter to summer. And it's funny really how things change. 1,700 events in 20 countries. And now it's 1,850 in 21. And in fact, we'll start on the South Island in New Zealand. And then kind of, as the time zones come into play, we'll go to Tokyo, Yakutsk, through Russia, through Central Europe, into the Nordics, into the UK and Ireland, then hop across the Atlantic uh, to, to Canada in Quebec, and then all the way over to Worcester on the far side of Canada. Now we grew all of that with our, our original mission statement, and I, I really believe in mission statements and things, and, and sometimes they can be a bit cheesy, and I think probably they spend a single day of their life living by it whatsoever. We genuinely live by ours all the time, and it used to be a park run everywhere somebody wants one. So we were quite reactive, people would come to us, and can we start one in Moscow, can we start one in San Francisco, whatever it might be, and we would support them and make that come true. And we were working towards this, this vision that we had that Paul had put in my head in 2007, and then in 2015, we realized we were we were struggling as an organisation. We didn't quite work out how we were going to get through the next few years. And the first thing Nick said was, I think your mission statement's rubbish and we need to change it. He said, look, it's not very ambitious. And, and at this point, I'm saying, hang on a minute, Nick. Like, we're saying a part run everywhere in the world that somebody wants one. Like, we could be in the, in the six figures of part runs here. What do you mean it's not ambitious? And he said, but it's not how you make your decisions. It's not actually what you're living by. Um, he said, you make your decisions because you want to make people healthier and happier. You don't make your decisions because you want there to be a park run there. And, that, and we thought about that and he said, let me give you an example. Some of the bigger sporting organisations, some like the Olympics, will make decisions based on wanting to have the Olympics there. So they'll happily be sponsored by whatever it is, Coca-Cola or McDonald's, if that's who they're sponsored by. And the argument you always hear, we couldn't have it without them. And so we're going to kind of weigh off these two, these two things. I kicked out a major sports drinks company out of our 
organisation. We said we didn't want to be partnered with sports drinks anymore. The reason why we didn't want to be supported by sports drinks companies was we think they're really, really bad for you. They rot your teeth and give you diabetes and you don't need them. So they're making people less healthy. So why would we partner with them? And of course, if your mission statement is a partner and everywhere somebody wants one, an organisation giving you money to help you do what you do is in line with that. So you can partner with a sports drinks company. But we weren't. Why weren't we? And we committed never to in the future to kind of cover everything we do and all of our decisions fit within that. However, it's also important that we have it. It's for everyone and it's forever and it's free. And that's really, really important. For everyone means it needs to be for everyone. Everybody needs to be able to engage in what we do in some way. And so many organisations will say those kind of things but don't really mean it. You know, we're only starting to learn the, the basics. So the real benefit will come in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time. Free totally changes the game. Three and a half million partners in the UK, which is fantastic. But not all of them. Most of them could afford to part one if it was 50p a week or whatever it was, but it would change it. it I, I go every single week with my family and my kids and my wife, and we volunteer, or we watch, or we run, or we walk. I could afford to pay 50p a week per person to do that, but I wouldn't, and I wouldn't go every week, and I don't quite know why that is. A year and a half ago, we started in prisons. These people can't take part in part run because they're stuck in a prison, and actually, there's a whole load of issues. We want to rehabilitate people. We want to help people get back into the community. And now I think we've got 15 events in prison uh, estates, which is really important for us. We would only do that if we were trying to make us healthier and happier. They're never going to make us sponsorship money. They're never going to buy loads of retail stuff. They're never going to be so many people that they add to our numbers in some massively significant way. But they are the least healthy, least happy people that we can get, we can reach at the moment. And so it's really important. And we're already getting stories of the mums of some of the boys that are in the prison. Um, part running outside, they'd be inspired by their sons who were in prison for the, some of the most horrendous things. They'd be inspired by their sons to go be active on the outside, which is incredible when you stop and think about that. We've also partnered with Royal College of GP, so now we have over 800 GP practices literally prescribing part run to their patients. So somebody comes in and says, I'm lonely, they prescribe them part run. Or somebody says, comes in and says, I don't feel like I've got any purpose, and they prescribe them part run volunteering. This has been one of our ways to get into the least healthy, least active, most isolated people, because word of mouth is a great thing, but word of mouth stops exactly where you want it to carry on. Many people at part run, Saturday is the first time in the week that they have a conversation with another person. And that, it's, when you stop and think about that, it's a, it's an amazing thing to think about. And of course, we don't have a reach into those people. They're not going to see our social media. They're not going to get our emails. They're not going to see me doing a talk like this. They're not going to see us on telly. They just sat at home, not speaking to anybody. On North Beach in Durban, that's about 1,600 people. We'll all get an accurate time emailed and texted to them probably within about an hour of finishing. Uh, and we do that by staying pretty much true to the same principles we've already had, which is you just register for free, you turn up, we don't really know you're there. When the starts, the clock starts, and off you go. When you cross the finish line, you get a finish position token. Now it's a barcode, which we can scan later to stop us making errors. You have a personal barcode, which could be a, be a printed out piece of paper, and then we join the two together. And of course, afterwards, what part one will know is at the end, you've got this kind of pile of 600 finish tokens. So there's 600 tokens, often in a totally random order. If you're organized, like somewhere like the Stray and Harrogate, they'll put their boxes in, you drop them in, and they're all kind of sorted for you. But if you're disorganized, like half of South Africa is just a massive great pile of 600 tokens that are sat there. So my dad sits in the cafe and they're sat there and they take about 45 minutes, maybe an hour to sort out one to 600, ready to put them back on the piece of string to give them out the following week. And my dad, being my dad, makes a mistake that everybody makes all the time. He says, can't you technologize this? Can't you automate it? Can't you make it easier? That's just taken three people an hour to do that. That's three hours work that you could just probably change, couldn't you? And I'm like, dad, you're missing the point. You've just made two friends, right? You've just sat down in a cafe and met two people. If you come next week, they'll go, hey Brian, how are you? If you're not here next week, they'll send you a message on Facebook or something and say, hey Brian, where were you? So why would I want to take that out? Why is that better? And of course he couldn't answer it, because of course it isn't better. The thing people always miss is they use technology for technology's sake. And we couldn't process a million results a month without incredible technology and incredible use of technology. Fundamental to what we do is that we use technology to empower human interaction, not to remove it. I mean, you see it at self-service checkouts in supermarkets. We have to work in a, you know, a non-competitive sporting environment, but we have to work to maximise human interaction. At the same time, it's really important that we use technology well because we can't scale without it. So we're growing at about 30% a year and about 330,000 participants roughly, which is an incredible level of growth. And we think that growth will increase rather than decrease.
Now we use the, the timing and scanning app because it means if somebody wants to start an event in the Falkland Islands or in San Francisco or in Siberia, wherever it is, we don't have to buy and send them a stopwatch scanner and buy and send them a laptop. We can just say, yeah, download the app and anybody can do that. And you're super motivated and inspired by what I've said and you go and register, you can print out your barcode. He then prints that piece of paper out. It's really cheap, really easy. He then brings it to the park run and when he finishes, he, he hands that piece of paper over. We scan it, we can't get it wrong and we know that's him. But of course, printers are dying at the moment and we think possibly the technology might not exist yet. We don't know the answer to how are we going to recognise Taisei Matsumoto and not everybody can afford to buy a wristband free or very, very, very close to free solution. I try and encourage people to think of us in human years. So we're 14 years old at the moment, we're 15 in October, and not really knowing what, how, what, what to do with ourselves and kind of bumbling our way through life. What, what really is it? What are we aiming for? How do we, how do we say to people this is what we do? Well, so far, we've seen about 47 million walk and walk jog and run performances and about uh, five and a half million uh, volunteering instances. So we've had about 50 million instances of participation. To put it into context a little bit, the London Marathon's had just over 1 million. We expect that by our 30th birthday, 2.5 million people a week, and that'd be a billion instances of walking, jogging, running, and volunteering.